Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of CNC Base Camp. Today I've got a fun project planned. It's an Art Deco vase. Now the inspiration for this came from a piece of Czech art glass made in the 1930s. It was a really pretty Art Deco form, so it's got a lot of life, a lot of action, and the glass color was called Uranium Green. Now it was probably pretty futuristic and neat in 1930, but it's a little creepy today calling something Uranium Green. So instead, we're gonna make it out of walnut, which I think will be really pretty. So if you take a look here on the screen, I've got it brought up, and our vase is going to consist of four sides, tapered sides, which we're gonna carve on the CNC machine. Those sides are then going to be glued together with a simple miter joint, which we'll cut on the table saw. And then there's a base to keep things stable, and we'll also add a small block on the interior of this cone section that, so that the base can be screwed securely in place. One of the interesting things in creating a shape like this is some of the tools that you can use within a 3D program. One of the tools I used is called a shell function. And the shell function allows you to create a shape on one side of a piece of material and then bring the other side to the same thickness. So for these individual parts, let me pull up. Here's a finished side. This is the back. I really wanted to make sure we took material off of the back so that when the, we look at the vase, we have an even thickness along the edge even though we've done all this carving. Now it's a little bit of a trial to create a lot of profile on one side of a piece and then to take that material out on the back and that's what the shell function does for you. So let's take a look here. I'm going to pull this into edit feature mode and this is the board that we'll be working on and you can see that I have the profiles formed for the front and then using the shell function the machine automatically removed the material in the back and through this parameter setting we can choose a different thickness. I have 0.375 in place right now and so it really makes creating these two-sided uh, shapes of the same thickness, simple and easy. And this is a function you'll find, I'm using Autodesk Inventor right now, but you'll find it on a Libre Atom or Fusion 360. It's a really handy tool to use. So it's the shell function. Now once we've created the basic profiles, you can see this is at, going to be our workpiece. I'm actually leaving things in a rectangular board. Once all this work is done, we're going to head to the table saw and we'll use a carrier board and cut the tapers and the miters using the table saw. It's really no different than any other function we would use on the table saw to cut long tapers. A little bit easier that way. Once we've completed our four sides, we're going to glue them together. We'll then use the carving function on our machine to create a simple base or if you choose, you could simply use your router table in a number of different bits and we'll assemble the two together. I will probably choose just a clear finish for my vase, although something like this really begs to have a lot of exotic finishes. You may want to try different um, glosses to your varnish, different stains, perhaps colored stains depending on the wood that you use. I think there's a lot of different, uh, a lot of different possibilities. So the first step that we need to do in creating the side is that I'm going to go ahead and use a quarter inch bit and we're going to drill two locating holes on our board because we are going to need to carve both sides. So we'll need to flip it over and we need an exact locating method in order to do that.
Well, it's time to start the finishing pass for the back of our project here. So I've got an eighth inch ball nose bit installed in the machine. I think we're ready to go. Well, we're done carving out the interior side of the side of our vase. So let's take a look. You can see it's following what will be the exterior profile of our piece, and that's using the shell command, and we've used a roughing pass and a finishing pass. The roughing with a quarter inch bit, the finish with an eighth inch bit, because the eighth inch ball nose is, uh, you know, it's pretty efficient. It gets the job done in a hurry, and we don't need anything super fine on the interior. I've got my uh, step over set at about 20%. Now when we go to do the exterior side, the finished side that we really see, I'll probably reduce that down to perhaps 12% step over. So what we're going to do now is we're going to flip over our workpiece, and then I brought two dowels along, and remember we drilled some uh, holes to help locate and orient the workpiece, so now I know that it's uh, it's flipped over exactly on center, and I can put my hold downs back in place. I changed bits out from that eighth inch ball nose to a quarter inch for a roughing pass, but I still need to zero it out. All right, the bits zeroed out. I've got my file loaded in and we're ready to start the roughing pass on the front of our side. Well, we're making progress with our first side. Got the roughing cut all done on the front. I've swapped out the bits back to the eighth inch ball nose, and let's go and start the finish cut for the front. Well, here's our completed side panel, ready to go to the table saw. Now, as you can see, we've got that nice sculpted look on the front. Using the shell function, we have that same shape in reverse on the back. Now, one thing you probably noticed, it was a lot of air cutting as we worked our way through to cut out this profile. That really can't be helped. You know, we have a surface high, we have a surface low, and it just takes a little bit of time for everything to work its way down. So this is definitely a project where you could uh, let your CNC run and go clean your workbench drawers, go sharpen your chisels, and do all those tasks you've been putting off, because there's some runtime involved here. But I think it's worth it. It's really fun to do something unique with your CNC machine that you just can't do any other way. So what's next? Well, I'm going to make three more sides, and then I'll head to the table saw and just use a carrier board and Cut the mitered edges on all these pieces. The miters are a little unique in that they're less than 45 degrees. They're about 45.65, and that always happens when we have a tapered side, a vase-like shape. There's also a base to be made. The base is made in the same way we've done the sides. We're going to start with a roughing cut and then use a finishing cut to get a nice smooth transitions and keep this sort of flowing shape. So there we go. Let me get to work here, finish up all our parts. When we meet again, it will be assembly time. Well, I finished milling all of our sides, so let's take a look at one. So this is the exterior, 
And remember I mentioned that shell function early on in the computer? And you can see the shell function mimics the exterior. The great thing about it is I only had to draw and model the outside. The shell function handled everything else. So it's a super command. I also mitered the edges. So that was done on the table saw using a simple sled, a couple little sticks of wood to keep things oriented, and a little trial and error. So just this edge here hung over my board. My saw blade was set at 44.65 degrees, or close to it, just a smidge off 45. Because it, when we have a four-sided structure and they splay out, the degree always goes below 45 degrees, but not as much as you might think, just a wee bit. So let's go ahead and we're going to spread a little glue here. Now if you wanted to, on a larger vases, you could always use a spline. I kind of felt like this was a good large width that would have a really good glue joint, so I'm not too concerned about it, about using a spline for this particular piece. And I'm just coating all the edges to make sure that we get good, good glue contact here. All right. I've got a mat here, and that's important. If you've ever tried to glue up a, a staved container, like if trying to make a bucket or a planter, those staves tend to wiggle everywhere, and it's hard to hold everything together. So anything you can do to kind of keep things a little more stable is a good idea. So a piece of carpet, uh, some of this material here, it really works out well. The other thing I've got here is some surgical tubing, and that's how I'm going to clamp this thing together. This stuff is incredible for hard to clamp items. You really need some for your shop. Uh, it, it, it sticks to itself. It's kind of grainy, so it's easy to tie, or you can just tuck the ends under it. It has lots of stretch. It's incredibly strong. It is just a super way to clamp odd objects. Now, the first thing I've done is to make a ring, and when I put these four pieces together, we're going to slide that ring on it to hold them all together. And that's how you keep things from just going completely out of control on you with these staved-type projects. And we'll put the tubing on, and I'm just going to start to roll it down, and as I do, it will tighten up. I'm going to take a second piece, and I'm going to start to wrap it around. And I can go kind of soft with the amount of tension and as it grabs I'm going to stretch the tubing a little more and add more tension. And then as I come to the, my end I'm just going to roll it under a couple of times, pull the ends and that's all I need to do and it'll stay put. And now I'll go back to this piece here and I'm going to continue to slide and roll it down and I found from dry fitting that if I just get it under this first little precipice that it holds it very nicely and keeps it from popping back. And there we go. We now have our four sides together. Our glue joints look tight. I think what's left for me to do is I will go in and clean things up a little bit with a wet rag and then it's a matter of being patient and then we'll go in and sand, sand, sand. Now I've got two other parts here for the vase. This is our base, so I'll just go ahead and set it on there for the moment. And that base was carved in the same manner as we did the sides. I used a roughing cut and a finish cut to produce the shape. One part that I'm going to put in a little bit later is this tapered plug. 
and that is going to go all the way down in the bottom of the upper part of our vase and that way I can simply run a screw through the bottom of this base and up into the plug and it will securely join everything together. So it should be a pretty easy assembly and very strong. All right then, we'll let it dry. I'll sand, I'll make it look beautiful, and we'll see it when it's all done. Well, we finished up our vase, and I'm pleased with it. I think it looks great. We've added a few flowers to set the scene. Now, as you can see, it's four pieces of wood. We used our CNC machine. We brought that CNC into the overall workflow with our standard shop tools so that we used our table saw to cut the tapers, dress everything up, and it really comes together well. Now, being of base, they're typically ceramic or glass, I wanted a pretty tight finish on it. So I've got five coats of lacquer with a little bit more gloss than I might usually use. And I think it complements this type of work. Also, I want to show you, I did a second vase. Now, this is a simple four-sided affair. Only the outside has been routed. And I created an STL file for it. And we used the same procedure as we did with these panels. So, we used a coarse bit for a rough cut, and then I finished up with a quarter inch ball nose bit for the finish cut. This one is a really easy to do because it is flat on the inside, so only one side is sculpted. And then the table saw, we just cut standard 45 degree miters, pretty easy. I did use my band saw to cut this top. I kind of wanted a little action, a little bit of movement to accentuate the wave pattern, but another alternative would simply be to have a solid heavy band or rim around the top and around the bottom. So a couple options that you can do this way or keep it uh, all square with a heavy rim. So as you can see, your CNC router is a fantastic tool for creating all sorts of vases, canisters, a lot of different things. It's all up to you and your imagination. So I hope you've enjoyed today making the Art Deco vase and also our wave pattern. Thanks so much for joining me. See you next month on another episode of CNC Basecamp. Well, as you know, building things in your shop, things can sometimes go wrong that you don't expect. So I wanted to show you something that happened to me while making our project today. This is one of the side panels in progress. Now we have the back and that was roughed out and also did the finish cut. Everything was fine. The roughing pass went fine for the front. The machine was busy with the finish pass on the front and all of a sudden the bit went out of control, went back through the back of the, my blank, around and towards the front again. And it just barely missed some bits of metal and I was lucky I stopped the machine before it bro broke the bit. I thought, well, okay, that's weird. Fine. I've got a, a lot of time invested in this part. I'll just go ahead and run the profile cut and I'll just finish what I need to by hand after going through the, all the other operations. Won't be too bad. Well, I put a straight bit in and we started running the profile pass. And what happens? All of a sudden, for no apparent reason, the router goes off to the interior and, and just destroys the part. Well, what's going on? Well, near as I can figure, what's happening is a, we're having an episode of electromagnetic interference, and that does happen sometimes. Now, I think I mentioned in a previous episode that I've had that occur when using my home-built Woodsmith machine. Uh, about two winters ago, I was using it, and I had a dust collector hooked up to it. We had very dry winter air and it just kept misbehaving. It would just stop, the machine would wander aimlessly. I didn't really have anything destroyed, but it was just so frustrating. Well, when I turned the dust collector off, everything returned to normal, and I finished out the day without any problem whatsoever. And this really seems similar. Now, what could have set it off? Well, with all this work to do, I was trying to use two machines at once. So I had my next wave machine working on this panel. I had the Woodsmith machine over here. I had the air cleaner on, and I had a vacuum cleaner on. There was just all sorts of things happening. So I'm going to guess it was a case of electromagnetic interference, causing the machine to lose its track and get a little bit confused. 
So I know I need to either separate them with a greater distance or run one machine at a time or it could never happen again. Who knows? But it's an interesting phenomenon. It's probably going to happen to you at some point. It's one of those things of operating a CNC machine in the home. Well, recently I've been having fun using a small benchtop CNC machine. You know, they come in at a great price point, they don't take up much room, and super fun. But there's a couple things about it that were kind of bothering me, and I wanted to see if I could improve it just a little bit. And we do that with a lot of tools around here. You know, think about upgrades to your drill press table or an outfeed table on the table saw. Sometimes doing a few things makes all the difference to bringing the tool up to performance. Well, I wanted to add a couple things. The first off, some storage. The router bits that I use for my CNC router are not the router bits I use in the balance of the shop. So I want those separate. And I also want a place for a wrench and all the different things that I might need. So I went ahead and made a base for my router and put in a nice deep drawer, full extension slides. Now, I like to use these little acro mill boxes and label all the bits because I've got a bunch of them and keep them all separate. If you want to put wood blocks and have them standing up, that's just fine. Also, I've got all my hold downs, a wrench, you know, guidebooks, anything you need. And it's just great to have it all in one spot. Another thing I wanted to do was I wanted to work a little bit with being able to hold down the workpiece. See, here's the deal. The aluminum table of you know, this router comes to about this point, and I can't hold anything down using hold downs or blocks or otherwise and still use the full format size of the router. So I've looked at two different solutions to that. Now, solution one is to use a spoil board. I've got this one loose right now, but I'm going to mount it down just using some simple screws. And these are spot welding nuts, and they fit the aluminum track just fine. You can buy those by the bucket full from uh, any of the industrial suppliers like McMaster Car or Granger. And they're also available from, I think, the, as accessories from the CNC companies too. So the Spoil board is much larger than the aluminum table. It hangs off the sides and it hangs off the front. And that really gives me a lot of options. Now I can screw down blocks of wood to hold work pieces in place. You know, one of the advantages is with a spoil board is that we'll surface it down and we can make it perfectly smooth and that increases your overall accuracy. And as things get cut up, you know, you simply resurface it and it's bright and new again. Well, what I like to do is to make a separate elevated board that represents the format size of my machine. That way I don't have to wonder if I put a part here, can the machine reach it? As long as I have it on this platform, I know that the machine can mill it. And when this gets chewed up and resurfaced and goes about all the way down to the surface of my primary board here, well I just take another piece and I glue it on and I start over again. It's super easy and there are no fasteners to hit. Now if I want to use the aluminum table, I can always loosen up the screws that hold those spot welding nuts on and simply slip the table out the back. Now I still have the same problem though. How do I mount anything, how do I hold anything down up at this front end of the router so I can use the full format size? Well that's what this is about here. Just a simple little plywood bridge and I've got some slots cut and then there's a groove underneath. That groove helps capture this head of my flange bolt. So it'll go in like this and that's going to prevent the flange bolt from turning and I can tighten up the hole down and clamp whatever I have in here. So now we're able to fully secure our workpiece and use the full format size, either using the bridge or by using the spoil board. And it's really made a difference, made it a lot easier to use this machine. Last thing, I wanted to look into a little bit of dust collection. 
Now on the show, we don't use dust collection very much because it's pretty dull watching a dust boot roam around on a board when you've got no idea what's going on underneath. But when we're not filming, I sure like to have dust collection going on. It's pretty easy to make a simple dust boot. There's a lot of different ways. This is one I've picked up on that's super simple, and that is using my CNC machine, I've cut a hole for the router or the spindle, and I've got a hole to insert a, uh, one of the plastic fittings of my vacuum hose. And then there's a, simply a carriage bolt running through, a nice wing nut that's easy on my hands, not one that's gonna make the arthritis scream. And as I tighten it, it'll of course close this kerf here and tighten up on the router. The skirting that we see here is a conveyor sweep. It's rubber backed. I wish the, the bristles were a little more dense, but hey, it's available and it's easy to use. I purchased this from McMaster Car. No doubt there are other sources. And it's easy to take on and off, which is a good thing. The only thing I am going to work on is that it would really be nice to have it a little easier to slip on and off when there's a bit mounted into the router. So I'm kind of looking at more of a clamshell approach in the future, which can be taken on and off from the side. And I think that's something we're going to have to address on the show is dust collection and making your own dust collection boots. Now, of course, the manufacturers offer have some offerings. I'm sure there are some entrepreneurs out there who have some dust boots as well. But you know what? They're easy to make, and you can also make them specifically for what you're doing, whether you're doing deep carving or shallow work or dealing with metal or whatever. Another important element of being comfortable and organized when using the CNC machine is that your controls need to be very visible. Now, this next wave machine comes with a little pendant, this black box here, which helps to control its motion, and you just use a flash drive. Uh, rather than having a computer. But whether you're using your laptop here or whether you're using a pendant, it sure is nice to have it placed so it's easy to see. For the pendant, I bought a little mount here, which I can change and adjust, screwed it to a board, and that means I can adjust it so it's easy for me to see without a lot of glare from the lights. And the same thing is going to be true if you have your laptop out. If you need to have it elevated, angled, then go ahead and find, find a solution and make it easy on yourself. So, a couple little things then to make a bit of a center here. It just makes it fun, it makes it organized, and I'm really enjoying that. So, a few thoughts for you. If you've got any thoughts, why don't you pass them on to me on the show site. I'd really enjoy hearing from you.